Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, in our lecture today, we're going to study some extremely important things. The things that we're going to study are so important, in fact, that the destiny of souls depends upon our comprehension of them. And so we ask for a special anointing of your Holy Spirit. Give us clear minds and give us tender hearts to listen to your voice and to be willing to accept what you teach us, no matter how much it might go against what we feel and what perhaps we have believed. And so we ask for your guidance in the precious name of Jesus, your beloved Son. Amen. In our study today, we are going to look at some very revolutionary concepts. I must say as we begin that this presentation is not going to be politically correct. In fact, it might ruffle some feathers. But I plead with the Lord and I've prayed to the Lord that He will allow those who hear this presentation to be objective in listening to the voice of God. Because I believe that what we're going to study in our lecture today is of critical importance and I believe that it is the truth as it's found in Jesus. And so all I ask is that those who listen to this presentation weigh the evidence Take a look at the arguments in the light of Scripture, first of all, and secondly, in the light of the spirit of prophecy. And I believe that uh, if this message is looked at openly and sincerely, you will see the extreme importance of what we are going to study. Now, it's not my intention in this study to offend anyone, although probably some people will be offended. The purpose of the presentation is not to be offensive. It's to not cause people pain. The purpose of the presentation is to present some critical truths for these last days. Truths that are so important that the destiny of souls depends upon our comprehension of these truths. And so I pray to God that if anything I say is painful to anyone, that uh, you will plead with the Lord to help you see what we are studying and understand the importance of it. It's out of a spirit of love that I'm sharing this message with those who are here today. I would like to begin by reading a statement from an individual with whom I disagree on almost everything. But on this one particular issue, he's right. I'm referring to Hal Lindsey the great futurist, individual who believes in the rapture of the church, the reestablishment of literal Israel, the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple, and so on. But in this statement, I believe that he's right on target. It's found in his book, Vanished into Thin Air, page 276. He says this, speaking about the seven churches of the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. I believe that these seven churches were selected and arranged by our omniscient Lord because they had problems and characteristics that would prophesy seven stages of history through which the church universal would pass. Basically what he's saying is that the seven literal churches of Asia Minor are actually symbolic of seven successive stages of church history. Once again, I want to read the most important part of his statement. He says, I believe that these seven churches were selected and arranged by our omniscient Lord because they had problems and characteristics that would prophesy, here comes the key part, seven stages of history through which the church universal would pass. This must mean that the first church is dealing with apostolic times because that's where the Christian church begins. And it must mean that churches number six and seven would come towards the end of Christian history because they're the last two churches. Now there's another author who agrees with Hal Lindsey. And uh, this author is uh, probably known by most of you, although 
those who uh, are watching this DVD presentation uh, maybe have not heard of this author. Her name is Ellen White. And she agrees with what Hal Lindsey says, but she adds details which he does not have in his quotation. The statement that I'm reading from her is found in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 585. Acts of the Apostles, page 585. And once again, she's addressing uh, the issue of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. She says this, The names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. I'm going to stop there for a moment. In other words, the names of the churches symbolize the church in different stages or periods of its history. She continues saying, the number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time. While the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. So she has here several important ideas. Number one, she says that the seven churches represent seven periods of church history. Secondly, she says that the number seven indicates that this is the complete history of the Christian church from apostolic times till the end of time. And in the third place, she says that the symbols used in each one of the churches reveal the condition of the church at any given stage where those symbols are mentioned in the sequence of the churches. Now there are three conclusions that we can reach based on these two statements that we've read at, at the beginning of our study today. First conclusion, the seven churches according to most conservative scholars, both Seventh-day Adventists and non-Seventh-day Adventists, represent, they believe that the seven churches represent seven successive stages in the history of the Christian church from the days of the apostles till the end of time. Indicated by the number seven, the totality or complete history of the Christian church. That's the first point. The second point that we can get from these statements is, and by the way tonight we're going to study uh, about the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia, this must mean that the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia, must come close to the end of the history of the Christian church. Because it's church number six. If church number one is the apostolic church, then church number six and seven will, will be at the very end of the age. Are you understanding my point? And so seven successive stages but we're going to discuss the church of Philadelphia which is church number six which means that this stage of church history must come very close to the end of the history of the Christian church. And third, this is a very important point, church number seven is the last church of the church age, as uh, Hal Lindsey calls it. It's interesting to notice that the name Laodicea, which is the seventh church, means judging the people. Now this is extremely important for what we're going to study in our lecture today. The name of the seventh church is Laodicea. It is a compound word in Greek which means judging the people. In other words, the seventh church is the period of the judgment of the church. Which means that the church of Philadelphia must come immediately before the judgment. Are you following what I'm saying? If the seventh church is judging the people, that must mean that the church of Philadelphia, the previous church, exists immediately before the church which is judged, or the church whose name means judging the people. Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, where we find the message to the church of Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, and we're going to do a preliminary reading of this passage, and we're going to stop after reading each one of the verses, and I'm going to make some remarks or comments as we go along. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, it says this, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, 
These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. Now the question is, who has the key of David? Well actually, if you read the messages to the churches, the one who has the key of David is Jesus. And so it says, he who has the key of David. Now, you notice a mention of a key. Now, what does that key open? We're not told in verse 7 yet. Notice what it continues saying. He who opens, and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. You'll notice that the key is going to open something. And it's going to open one thing, and it's going to shut another. And nobody can open what has been shut, and no one can shut what has been opened. Now, we have the mention of the key, and opening and closing, but we're not told exactly what the key opens. But now let's go to verse 8. Verse 8. It says here, I know your works. See, I have set before you a what? an open door. Oh, now we know what the key opens. The key opens a what? The key opens a door according to this. So we know that a door is opened with the key. But the question is, to where does that door lead once the door is opened? That is not directly addressed here in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8, but we're going to come to it later. So a door is opened with the key, but we're not told where that door leads to. Obviously it leads into a building someplace. Now notice once again, I know your works, verse 8, I have see, I have set before you an open door, and no one can what? Can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. And then in verse 9 we have a very interesting expression. It says there, once again, it's still speaking in the context of the church of Philadelphia. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. Now we need to ask the question, what is the synagogue of Satan? We'll just ask the questions and we'll, we'll answer those questions later. But it says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. And now notice, who say they are Jews and are not. What does that mean? A counterfeit Jew. Well, we'll leave that question open for now too. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. And so reviewing what we have in the context of the church of Philadelphia, you have the key of David. The key of David opens a door. We're not told what is inside that door, but it opens a door. And when the door is opened, you have in the same context a mention of the synagogue of Satan, those who say that they are Jews and are not Jews. Now we're going to, um, we're going to decipher all of this language in a few moments. In fact, Let's speak first of all about the key of David. In order to understand the key of David in Revelation chapter 3, we must go back to the Old Testament source. This expression comes from Isaiah chapter 22 and verses 22 and 23. This is a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about something that the Messiah is going to do in the future from Isaiah's day. It says there in Isaiah chapter 22 and verses 22 and 23, and there's some details here that are not found in Revelation 3. It says, the key of the house of David, who came from the house of David? Kings, right? And the key of the house of David, now notice this, I will lay on his shoulder. That is of critical importance. Where is the key? The key that opens the door, the key of David, it's on the Messiah's what? Shoulder, according to this. 
And now notice, so he, and by the way this is Jesus, it's a messianic prophecy, so he shall open and no one shall shut. And he, once again the Messiah, shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. And he will become, now notice what the Messiah is going to become, the Messiah will become a what? A glorious throne to his father's house. Let me ask you, do you have the idea of kingship in this verse? You most certainly do. You have a reference to the house of David. You have a reference to a glorious throne. In other words, the idea is the idea of kingship. And the key is going to be where? The key is going to be upon the shoulder. The key of David that opens the door is on the Messiah's shoulder. Now go with me to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. We find a very interesting reference here also to the shoulder. It says there in Isaiah 9, 6, and then we'll read verse 7 because it has some very important points. And by the way, there's probably no one here who has never read this verse. Uh, it's a messianic prophecy uh, referring to Jesus Christ. We're told here, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And now notice this. And the government will be upon his shoulder. What does it mean to have the key on the shoulder? It means to have what? The government. So what does the key do? The key opens the door which allows him to get his what? His government. Remember the idea of kingship that we found in Isaiah 22 verses 22 and 23? Now let's continue reading. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So do you see the relationship between the key, the shoulder, and having the government? In other words, ruling? Now notice verse 7, here is where it becomes even more interesting, because there's an, another idea that comes in. It says here, speaking about the same individual, his government will increase. He will sit upon the what? The throne of David. What does the key allow him to do? It opens the door for him to do what? To sit upon what? To sit upon the throne of David to do what? To rule. Notice. It says once again, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David, obviously as king, and over his what? Over his kingdom. To order it, now notice this, to order it and establish it with what? With judgment. What is it that establishes his kingdom? His kingdom is established by judgment according to this. So it says, with judgment and justice from that time forward, even how long? Forever. How long is his kingdom going to last when he sits on the throne of David as a result of using the key that's on his shoulder? His kingdom is going to last forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now do you see all of the ideas that are coming through here? You have first of all the Messiah. The Messiah has a key. The key is on his shoulder. With the key he opens a door. And by going in through the door he's going to establish his what? He's going to establish his kingdom. And how is he going to establish his kingdom? He's going to establish it with judgment and with justice according to this. So if he's going to go into the door, he's going there to get his what? To get his kingdom by performing a work of judgment. Critically important. And this of course is the source of Revelation 3, 7, and 8. Because there you have the idea of the key, the open door, the shut door. So wherever the door leads, 
The key that opens the door leads to the judgment and to taking over the government or the what? Or the kingdom. Are you following what I'm saying? This is critically important. Now, the question is, where does this door lead to? The fact is, folks, that the book of Revelation mentions two doors. Now let's discuss, first of all, the first door. And where that first door leads to in the book of Revelation. Go with me to Revelation chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. We're going to talk about the first door and where that first door leads to when that door is opened. Revelation 4 verses 1 and 2. And while you're looking for that text, if I can just mention that uh, we have studied this text in the Genesis series. Uh, we had a whole presentation on, on this particular uh, chapter, and the title of that presentation was The War Hero Returns. And in fact, this chapter is describing, the, uh, chapter 4 is describing the preparation of the heavenly throne room to receive Jesus, who is coming back from earth as a conqueror to heaven at his ascension. And then chapter 5 describes how Jesus comes into the presence of his father. He actually arrives in chapter 5, and his father gives him the book or the scroll, which is the testament of the human race. And now he's going to reveal who is going to inherit with him, who is going to inherit the kingdom with him. Now, notice Revelation chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open where? in heaven. So is there an open door in heaven in this verse? Yes. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set up where? In heaven. Is the throne inside the door? There's an open door, right? And John, through, in vision, goes through the door, and inside the door he sees a what? He sees a throne. Now we don't have time to go over what we've already studied, but allow me just to mention that there in chapter 4, we have a throne, and it continues saying that there was one who sat on the throne. You'll notice that there was only one on the throne in Revelation chapter 4. Now, he's not the only one there. We're told that also around that one throne where there is one individual seated, there are 24 thrones where the 24 elders are seated. By the way, the one who is seated on the, th on the throne is God the Father. Those who are seated on the 24 thrones, which are known as the 24 elders, we've already studied this, represent the, the representatives uh, of the worlds that never sinned, of the sinless realms of the universe. The worlds have representatives, in other words, in the heavenly court. There present also are the four living creatures. We've studied that those represent the cherubim and the seraphim. But as you look at chapter 4, you discover that there are some elements that are missing. First of all, Jesus isn't mentioned in chapter 4. He's absent. In fact, let's notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, something very interesting that Jesus uh, says about himself. Revelation 3 verse 21. Jesus says, and this is the conclusion to the message of the Laodicean church, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Where did Jesus sit when he went to heaven? When he ascended to heaven, where did he sit? He sat on his father's throne. So how many should be on the throne? After the ascension, two. But in Revelation 4, how many are on the throne? One. So it must mean that in Revelation 4, the second person has not arrived yet. Chapter 4 describes the heavenly throne room prepared for the arrival of Jesus in chapter 5. And we know that because Jesus himself says that when he ascended to heaven, he sat with his father on his throne. In that case, there should be two on the throne. But in Revelation 4, there's only one. So in Revelation 4, there's no reference to Jesus. There's no reference to angels. The angels, there's cherubim and seraphim, but the angelic host is not there in chapter 4. There is no reference to redemption in chapter 4. 
no reference what, whatever to redemption, and all of the songs that are sung by the elders and the four living creatures praise the Father who is seated on the throne because He's the Creator. In other words, He's not praised because He's the Redeemer, but because He's the Creator. So chapter 4 is describing the preparation of the heavenly throne room before the arrival of Jesus. And by the way, the reason why Jesus is not there in chapter 4, and the reason why the angelic host is not there either, is because Jesus at that moment is being escorted by the angels, the cloud. Remember he was caught up in a cloud when he came back to heaven? He was caught up by the cloud of angels, and now he's ascending to heaven, and in chapter 4 the throne room is prepared with the cherubim, the seraphim, God the Father, and the representatives of the worlds to receive Jesus who is coming back as a conqueror. And meanwhile, the heavenly beings are singing honor and glory and praise to the Father who is seated it upon the throne and they're praising him not because he's the redeemer they're praising him because he is the what because he is the creator because the redeemer has not arrived yet are you with me or not now where is this scene taking place where is this uh, scene of Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 where Jesus actually arrives as the Lamb, it says He comes to where His Father is, and suddenly all of the angelic hosts are around the throne. In what place in heaven is this taking place? Where in heaven does this door lead to where this throne is, where Jesus goes when He ascends to heaven? The fact is there's no doubt that this is taking place in the holy place of the sanctuary. Allow me to give you two explicit reasons in Revelation chapter 4. Notice Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. It says there, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And now notice this. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, let me ask you, where were the seven lamps of fire in the Hebrew sanctuary? They were in the holy place. So the throne here is where the seven branch candlestick is. And the seven branch candlestick was in the holy place in the Hebrew sanctuary. So where is the scene of Revelation 4 taking place? It's taking place in the holy place. By the way, chapter 5 is in the same place. If you continue reading chapter 5, it's not a different location. It's the same location. The only difference is that Jesus now arrives with the angelic host at His ascension and presents Himself before His Father as the Lamb as though He had been slain. Now secondly, the second reason why this is taking place in the holy place is because of what we find in Revelation 5 and verse 8. Go with me to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. It says there, now when he had taken the scroll, now Jesus takes the scroll in chapter 5 because he's arrived, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of what? Of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Question, where was incense offered in the Hebrew sanctuary? Incense was offered in the bowls in the holy place, at the altar of incense. In fact, go with me to Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4, and you'll see very clearly where the incense or the prayers of the saints were offered. It says there in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, Then another, another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. Which altar is this? Stood at the altar. Is this the altar of sacrifice or the altar, the golden altar of incense? It's the one of incense. Let's continue reading. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. Is that the same expression we found in Revelation 5 verse 8? Yes. With the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. Where was that altar? In which apartment? In the holy place. That's right. Which was before the throne. Where is the throne? It's in the holy place, according to this. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Now if you want further corroboration from the spirit of prophecy on this, 
uh, the lesser light which bears testimony to the greater light, the Bible. You can read Desire of Ages, pages 833 to 835, where Ellen White describes in chapter 4 the preparation of the throne room in heaven for the arrival of Jesus with the angels, and how Jesus entered the holy place of the sanctuary uh, amidst the rapturous song of the angels, and how He received the scroll from the hand of the Father who was seated upon the throne. Ellen White makes it very clear that this whole scene is taking place in the holy place. So let me ask you, where does this first open door lead to? It leads into the holy place. At which historical occasion? At the ascension of Christ. Now, don't miss this next point. It's of critical importance. Can the open door, which is placed before the church of Philadelphia, refer to this open door? I'll let you digest that question for a moment. Can the door of the church of Philadelphia, the sixth church, be referring to the same door that was open in Revelation chapter 4? It can't be. Because in Revelation chapter 4, the door was opened when? The door was opened when Jesus ascended to heaven. The sixth church is when? Way towards the end of church history. So is that door which is opened before the church of Philadelphia the same door which was opened at the ascension of Christ? Absolutely not. I hope that you're understanding my point. It's of critical importance. Now let's go to the second door which is opened in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. This is a very important verse. I want you to notice what it says. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Now I want to read this verse again because there's some very important items in it. It says here, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Now in Greek there are two words for temple. One is the word hieron, which refers to the totality of the temple, the whole building. That is not the word that is used here. The Greek word which is used here is naos which means inner shrine of the temple. It actually is referring to the most holy place of the sanctuary, which is open. Now, the first door, when it was opened, it led into where? To the holy place. This second door, when it is opened, where does it lead to? It leads to the naos, or to the inner shrine of the temple. Because that what's, that's what the word naos means. So it says, then the temple, or the inner shrine of God was opened. Must it have been closed till this point? Yes. What must it have been opened with? With the key of what? Of David. And why would Jesus be going in there? According to what we studied in Isaiah chapter 9. He would be going in there to perform a work of what? Of judgment in order to establish His kingdom. Now... It says, the naos of God was opened in heaven, and what was seen? And the ark of His covenant was seen in His naos. When this door is opened, what is seen in the naos? The ark of the covenant. Which apartment does this door lead to? It leads into the most holy place. So let me ask you, the key that opens the door, opens how many doors? It opens two doors. The first door is when Jesus, what? Ascends to heaven. The door to the holy place is opened, where the seven branch candlestick is, and where the altar of incense and the bowls of incense are. That's where Jesus goes in before His Father. And then, in the church of Philadelphia, 
and according to Revelation 11 verse 19 another door is open in heaven, that's the temple, uh, the temple door to the inner shrine to the naos, and when that door is opened with the key what is seen in the temple? The Ark of the Covenant. Let me ask you, must the first door have been closed when the second door was open? Obviously yes, because the whole heavenly host is actually leaving the first apartment and they're moving where? Then they're moving to the second apartment of the sanctuary. Are you with me so far? Now you say this is all academic. It's academic but it's extremely important because if we don't understand this the spirit of prophecy tells us that we will be caught and swept away by the delusions of Satan in these last days. Now this scene is described also in the book of Daniel. The opening of the heavenly temple for the judgment and for Jesus to take the kingdom is also mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. Now go with me to Daniel chapter 7 and as you're looking for that chapter let me ask you this. Was the most holy place the location where the judgment took place? On the great day of atonement is that when the separation was made? Yes. Does the Ark of the Covenant contain the law by which God's people are judged? We will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. So when Revelation 11:19 says that the temple of God was opened obviously with the key of David, is there a work of judgment that's going to take place in there because of the Ark of Co the Covenant being there? Obviously yes. Now notice Daniel chapter 7 and verses 9 and 10. And do you know when this is taking place? Let me just give you a little historical context. In Daniel 7 you have a lion, you have a bear, you have a leopard, you have a terrible dragon beast. The dragon beast sprouts ten horns and then among the ten horns rises a little horn and the little horn rules 1260 years. Now we've studied this before. The lion is Babylon, the bear is Medo-Persia, the leopard is Greece, the dragon beast is Rome, the ten horns represent the ten divisions into which Rome was divided, the little horn represents the Roman Catholic papacy which rules from 538 to 1798. Now listen, to, listen up to what I'm going to say because this is critically important. According to what we're going to read in Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10, this takes place after the little horn has ruled for 1260 years. Now when did that rule come to an end? Which date? 1798. Which means that the scene that we're going to read about must take place after which date? It must take place after 1798 because it's after the rule of the little horn that this scene that we're going to read about takes place. Let me ask you, would that be very similar to the period of the church of Philadelphia? Is this towards the end of the history of the Christian church? Obviously yes. Now notice what we find in Daniel chapter 7 and verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place. Thrones, singular or plural? Thrones. Did we have thrones in Revelation chapter 4? How many, th how many thrones did we have in Revelation chapter 4? Uh, we had 24 thrones for whom? For the 24 elders. Was there also an additional throne for God the Father? Yes. Are we going to have the same phenomenon now? Is God the Father going to sit on a throne and are there other thrones there as well? Yes. It must mean that now the beings that were in the first apartment of the sanctuary are going to what? The Father is going to what? Move from this throne to this one. And the thrones which were in the holy place where the 24 elders were to receive Jesus upon His ascension now are moved and they're put where? In the most holy place. In other words the scene moves. The door to the holy place was opened in Revelation chapter 4, Jesus ascends, He goes before His Father, there present is God the Father on the throne, there's 24 elders on the thrones, the angelic host is present there in the holy place. But in Daniel chapter 7 this is taking place after the dominion of the little horn, long after the time that Jesus ascended to heaven. And now you once again have a throne, and you have thrones, and we're going to notice that there's the angelic host present again. 
But now the door which they go through is not the door of the holy place, it is the door of the what? Of the most holy place. Because this is during the period of the sixth church. This is at the end of the history of the Christian church, not at the beginning when Jesus ascended. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. This is of critical importance. Now, notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place. Were they there before? Or are they put there at a certain point in history? They're put there at a certain point in history. And the Ancient of Days was seated. Is this the same one who was seated on the throne in Revelation 4? Does he move now? Sure. And now notice, his garment was white as snow, and the hair is of, of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels, oh, what are wheels for? They're for moving. So is the throne of God movable? You know, some, some people say, well, the throne of God was always in the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant was the throne of God. I beg to differ. Scripture says that the throne of God is movable. In fact, we notice that it moved from the holy to the most holy because it says that thrones were placed there, which means that they weren't there before. And so it says, His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. And now notice the angelic hosts. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Uh, is this the same angelic host of Revelation 5 verse 11? Absolutely yes. Are they all moving now into this second apartment? Absolutely. And it says, the court was seated and the books were opened. Is this the same scene of Revelation 11 and verse 19 where the temple of God is open in heaven and the ark of His testament, the ark of His covenant is seen? No doubt. Because in the most holy place the judgment took place because inside the ark were the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments are the standard of the judgment. And so this passage is parallel to Revelation 11 and verse 19. Now I want you to notice something else that is very interesting. There's no reference so far to Jesus. It just says that thrones were placed. The Father goes in and He sits down. There's 10,000 times 10,000 angels that go in to minister with Him. But so far in verses 9 and 10 there's no reference to Jesus. You wonder where is Jesus? Uh, is He perhaps still in the holy place where He ascended to? Well now let's go to verses 13 and 14. It says there in verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Now you know that this is a different period in human history, because the first time that Jesus went to His Father, He presented Himself as a lamb as though He had been slain. He's just come from dying on the cross. He comes as a lamb. But here in Daniel chapter 7, He's coming as whom? As the Son of Man. This is a different historical context. And so it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with what? With the clouds of heaven. What are the clouds of heaven here? They are angels. Did Jesus come with the clouds of heaven to the holy place in Revelation chapter 5? He most certainly did. Now is He moving with the angels with the clouds to, to another place? To a second apartment? By the way, He's moving to, to a place in heaven, not to the earth. This was the mistake that the Millerites committed. They read Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 and they understood this as Jesus coming to the earth. But it doesn't say that He's coming to the earth. And so it says, I was watching in the visions of the night and behold one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to where? To the Ancient of Days. Did the Ancient of Days sit there first? Yes, and then who came? Jesus. Revelation 4, was the Ancient of Days seated there first? And then who came? Jesus. Are they two different apartments? Yes, they are two different apartments. Different periods of history. Revelation 4 and 5, the ascension. The sixth church towards the end of church history. Because it's one of the last churches. Now, it says, He came to the Ancient of Days, and they, that is the angels, brought Him near before Him. And what does He come for? Obviously he comes for the judgment because it says that the judgment was set and the books were opened. But what is, the, what is the end result of the judgment? Notice, critically important. Then to him 
was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Any relationship with Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7? How is the kingdom established in Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7? With judgment and with what? Justice. And what does he use the key for? He uses the key to go in through an open door to take over the what? The throne and the kingdom. So is this judgment process going to take place in the church of Philadelphia? Yes, because the quotation comes from Isaiah 22. Now notice, it says, Then to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Did we notice that expression in Isaiah 9? Where the government is upon his shoulder, the key is upon his shoulder. Yes, it says his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be what? Which shall not be destroyed. Let's go to Daniel 7, 26 and 27, which repeats the same scene, but it gives additional details. It says there in verses 26 and 27, but the court shall be seated. Is that a judgment? What apartment is that taking place in? The most holy. Is it the same as Revelation 11, 19? The temple opened and the ark of his testament where the law is found. Is it the same open door that is placed before Philadelphia to enter? Under the sixth church? Yes, because the next church is called judging the people. You're not with me, are you? Yeah? Praise the Lord. Good. And the court shall be seated. And they shall take away his dominion, that is the dominion of the little horn, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and what? And obey him. Now allow me to read you a very interesting statement that we find in the book Early Writings. The earliest writings of Ellen White. By the way, this is a vision that Ellen White saw in 1846. She was called as a prophet in 1844, in December of 1844. So this is, if we could say, the early Ellen White. Now I want you to see how she understood this uh, vision of Daniel chapter 7, because she saw it in vision as well. I'm go it's a, quite an extensive statement, but I want to read it because it's critically important. In fact, I'm going to read a lot of statements from Ellen White once we have finished the biblical foundation. We're dealing with the biblical foundations, then we look at Ellen White. Notice what she says. I saw a throne, and on it sat the Father and the Son. So she saw a throne, and where, who was on the throne? The Father and what? The Father and the Son. Do you think that throne was in the Holy or Most Holy? Hmm. The Holy. Let's continue reading. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired His lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered Him. Before the throne I saw the Advent people the church and the world. By the way, they're there symbolically, they're not there in person, obviously, because this is taking place in heaven. Before the throne I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. I saw two companies, one bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then He would look to His Father and appear to be pleading with Him. A light would come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. Is this the intercessory work of Christ? Is this the prayers of the saints that we read about in Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 8? This is the work of the holy place. Now, notice what she continues saying. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it, and their countenances shone with its glory. 
In other words, this is the idea of presenting the prayers to Jesus, Jesus presenting them before the Father, and the Father blessing the people with the assurance of forgiveness and with every spiritual blessing in high places. This is the work of the holy place. Now notice what she continues saying. I saw the Father rise from the throne. Hello? She saw the Father what? Rise from the throne. And now notice. And in a flaming chariot go into the holy of holies within the veil and sit down. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if the Father got up from the throne and he went into the holy of holies and sat down the throne he was sitting on before must have been in the holy place. Hello? Yeah? Of course. She continues saying, now notice this. I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the holy of holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose and they were left in perfect darkness. Only those who rose with Jesus and followed him by faith according to this. Now notice, th those who rose, excuse me, when Jesus did, kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm and we heard his lovely voice saying, wait here. I am going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Of course, that's not in the Bible, is it? Is it in Daniel 7? Is it in Revelation 11? Is it in the church, the message to the church of Philadelphia? Revelation 3. It's the open door. The second open door in heaven. She continues saying, Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were bowed down with him rose also, and the rest, the careless multitude, were left in darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did, kept their eyes fixed on Him as He left the throne, and led them out a little way. Then He raised His right arm, and we heard His lovely voice saying, Wait here, I am going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to Myself. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire, surrounded by angels, came to where Jesus was. He stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the Father sat. What chapter of the Bible is Ellen White commenting on here? Daniel chapter 7, where we just read, isn't she? Now notice, there I beheld Jesus, a great high priest, standing before the Father. On the hem of His garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Those who rose up with Jesus would send up their faith to Him in the holiest and pray, My Father, give us Thy Spirit. Then Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. In that breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. Who were the only ones that received according to this? The breath of Jesus, which is the Holy Ghost, and light, power, love, joy, and peace. Who were the only ones who would receive that? Those who kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, and when Jesus got up and moved into the Holy of Holies, they by faith did what? They moved into the Holy of Holies with Him. Now immediately you ask, what happened with all those people that were bowed before the throne that did not keep their eyes fixed on Jesus and stayed in the holy place? Now comes a chilling statement by Ellen White. She says this, I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. By the way, these are the counterfeit Jews of the synagogue of Satan. I'll just throw that out for now. By the way, they're also Babylon, which re rejects the first angel's message. The hour of his judgment has come. That's just my interjection. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. 
they did not know that Jesus had left it. Why not? Because they didn't follow Jesus through Scripture into the Holy of Holies. Now listen to this. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne. Those who are bowed praying. Let me ask you, do these claim to be Christians? If they're bowed before the throne, do they claim to be Christians? But whose followers are there? Wow. This is amazing, you say. So whoever stays in the holy place and does not follow Jesus into the holy of holies is in danger of worshiping whom? Satan. Remember the church of Philadelphia? God places an open door. The key opens the door so that Jesus can go in and he can perform a work of judgment and take over the kingdom. In Philadelphia there are those who follow Jesus through the open door. But there's another group referred to as what? As the synagogue of Satan. They say they're Jews, but they're not. We'll come to that in a moment. Now notice what she continues saying. Those who were bowed before the throne would say this. Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power. Light in the sense that the devil gives light, obviously. Not in the sense that God gives light. There was much light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived. Who deceived? The ones who were still what? Bowing before the throne. To, and notice, not only to keep them de deceived, and to draw back and deceive God's children. What does draw back mean? It means to get God's children who follow Jesus into the most holy place to draw back. In other words, to backslide. To forsake what they once believed when they entered with Jesus into the most holy place. And I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but that's happening now. In the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, let's pause here for a moment and ask this question. When the most holy place was opened in 1844, those who had their eyes fixed on Jesus went into the most holy place, whereas those who did not stayed where? In the holy place. Those who went into the most holy place are, were benefited by the intercession of Jesus. Those who stayed in the holy place were now under the delusions and the power of Satan. When you go into the most holy place of the sanctuary, what do you see? You see the Ark of the Covenant. Now let me ask you this. What is in the Ark of the Covenant? The Law of God, the Ten Commandments. Correct? Now when you see the Ten Commandments, what do the Ten Commandments tell you? That you're a what? That you're a sinner. So when you see the law, you say, I'm a sinner. I'm undone. But then what does Jesus say? That if we repent and we confess our sin, He will be faithful and just to what? To forgive our sins. And by the way, when we come to Jesus in faith, you know, we go into the most holy place, we see the law, and we recognize our sinfulness. That leads us to repentance and to confess our sin. And then we send our sins to whom? To Jesus, into the most holy place. And what does he do? He, he puts them in the sanctuary covered by his blood. And what's going to happen with all of those sins that have been repented of and confessed on the Day of Atonement? What is he going to do with those sins that have entered through the blood of Jesus? They are going to be taken out and cleansed and not held against God's people. That's the message of the most holy place. But there's more. You have the law. What is at the center of the law? The Sabbath. Huh. Is the idea of healthful living contained there? The first angel's message says, Fear God and give glory to Him. Does the Apostle Paul say that we're supposed to glorify God with our body and with our spirit, which are God's? Yes. That's an aspect of glorifying God. Let me ask you, when you go into the most holy place, 
Do you grasp and understand the doctrine of the judgment? That Jesus is now cleansing the heavenly sanctuary when you go in there? Absolutely. And so you have a cluster of ideas. You have the law, you have the Sabbath, you have healthful living. You have the idea that now, since 1844, we are in the judgment and we're to put our lives in harmony with the law of God because we're in the judgment. By the way, also there you find the doctrine of the state of the dead. Because if Jesus begins his work of judgment, separating the righteous from the unrighteous in 1844, then they did not go to heaven or to hell before they were judged. That means that, that they've been where? They've been in the grave. They didn't go to heaven or hell. In that case, they would have received their reward before they were judged. And so the idea of the judgment also contains within it the idea that the dead know nothing. Let me ask you, are these the distinctive teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist church? Are they? Yes. What does much of the Christian world say? They say, the law was nailed to the cross. We're not under law, we're what? We're under grace. Why can't they see the importance of the law? Because they're in the holy place. What day of the week do they keep? They keep the first day of the week. Why? Because if they went with Jesus into the most holy place, they would see that at the center of the law is what? The Sabbath. What do they say about principles of healthful living and taking care of our body temple? They say anything goes. It's not what you eat that defiles a man. God has made everything clean. Just pray. And to pray or cleanse the pork. Is that in harmony with the message of the most holy place? No, because we're to glorify God with our body and with our spirit. Give glory to Him, the first angel's message says. Let me ask you, what do the churches say about the idea that, that Adventists have that now there's a work of judgment and the sins are entering the sanctuary and only those sins that have entered by the blood of Jesus will be cleansed from the sanctuary and placed upon the scapegoat of Zazel or Satan. What do they say about that? They say that idea of the Adventists is totally wacky. And of course, they cannot, they, they cannot understand the importance of preparing a character for heaven because they don't realize that Jesus will only cleanse from the sanctuary the sins that we have placed in the sanctuary. What do they teach about death? They teach that the dead know everything. In other words, when a person dies, they go to heaven if they were good, or they go to hell if they were bad, and there's one church that teaches that they go to purgatory if they were half good, or half bad. You see, but when you go into the most holy place, suddenly you grasp this cluster of truth that is sustained by the Adventist church. The law, the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the investigative pre-advent judgment, healthful living, it's all in there. The distinctives of the Adventist church and the Christian world cannot see it because they're in the wrong apartment. Are you following me? Here we find the true picture of what's happening in the Christian world today. By the way, do you know that the first angel's message has the same elements of the most holy place? The first angel's message says, fear God. Do you know that that expression, fear God, in Scripture is constantly linked with keeping God's commandments? For example, Ecclesiastes 12 says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Time and again in the Old Testament, fearing God is linked with keeping God's commandments. So when the first angel says, Fear God, it's saying, Keep His what? Commandments. It says, Give glory to Him. It's the same expression that Paul uses when he says we're supposed to glorify God with our body and with our spirit. Our spirit means our mind. Does that mean that we have to be careful about what we allow to come through our mind, through television and other means? Yes, we're supposed to be, keep our body temple, mind, and physical nature fit. That's the most holy place message. No wonder most Christians don't see any problem going to the movie theater and seeing violence and illicit sex. Because they don't understand the first angel's message that says that Jesus is coming soon and we need to prepare a character fit for heaven. Our mind 
then our body needs to be sanctified and cleansed and prepared for living with Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall feel, see God. Anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Jesus will come and he will receive a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what scripture teaches. And that's what going into the most holy place teaches. Are you understanding me? Does the first angel's message also tell us that we are in the hour of the judgment? Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Does the first angel's message point out the Sabbath? Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. Do we have in the most holy place the same elements of the first angel's message? Absolutely. And they are the distinctive teachings of the Adventist church which the Christian world rejects. By the way, do you remember that the church of Philadelphia, an open doors place, that's the door to the most holy place so that they can see that Jesus is going in for the judgment to receive the kingdom. By the way, the kingdom is composed of, of them, those who are faithful. Do you notice here, also in the church of Philadelphia, that there's a group that is addressed as the synagogue of Satan? Now let me ask you, what are those who reject the first angel's message called? The second angel's message says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Why did Babylon fall? It says because Babylon has given all nations to drink of the what? Of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is the wine? The wine are false what? Doctrines, false doctrines in contrast to the true doctrines which are found in which message? in the first angel's message in the most holy place. Ideas such as the law of God was nailed to the cross, Christians can't keep the law, Jesus had a different nature than we have. He had the nature of Adam before the fall. I mean what hope is there for us to overcome? We can't do it, you know. He knows that we're going to continue sinning until He comes, but He'll just somehow He'll cover it with His grace and with His love. And what about the Sabbath? Oh no, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. Today it's the Lord's Day, it's Sunday. And what do they say about the judgment? No, the judgment, that takes place when you die. You go to heaven or to hell, that's it. No judgment in heaven. What do they say about the state of the dead? Well, the dead, when they die, you know, they go to heaven or they go to hell. Does the Christian world reject the distinctive message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes, and that's the reason why they became Babylon. Because instead of giving the first angel's message, which invites people to go into the most holy place, they give people the wine of the wrath of her fornication, false doctrine. Babylon is the same as the synagogue of Satan. Hello, I told you this was going to be strong stuff, but it's the truth. Now let's talk about the synagogue of Satan just for a few moments. Babylon in the second angel's message is the same as the synagogue of Satan in the message of the church of Philadelphia. Do you see that? Now, Revelation 3 verse 9 says this, Indeed I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, indeed I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So there's a group that are called the synagogue of Satan and they say they're Jews, but they're not. Now is this talking about literal Jews? Listen, this is the contradictory aspect of theologians like Hal Lindsey. See Hal Lindsey says there's the church age, and then there's the age for the Jews after the rapture. He says the messages to the churches apply to the church before the rapture. But everything else, starting with Revelation 4 all the way through the end, applies to the literal Jews after the rapture. Now if that's true, and by the way he says that you're supposed to take everything from Revelation 4 on literally, but you're supposed to take what's in the churches symbolically, let me ask you why in the third church would you have a reference to Balaam? Is that literal Balaam? Oh no, no, that's a symbolic Balaam. Uh, in the fourth church you have a reference to Jezebel. Is that literal Jezebel? No, no, that's symbolic Jezebel. So what type of biblical 
gymnastics can you use to say that what the church is Jewish terminology is to be understood symbolically whereas in the later part of the revelation is, is to be understood literally are you understanding my point? now notice what a Jew is according to scripture these individuals who say they are Jews but are not but they lie notice Romans 2 28 and 29 we must go through this quickly Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29 here the Apostle Paul explains what a Jew is he says for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh but he is a Jew who is one what? inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in other words a converted heart converted to whom? to Jesus in the spirit not in the letter whose praise is not from men but from God let me ask you what is a Jew according to the definition of the Apostle Paul? a Jew is an individual who has been converted to Jesus and who has received the Holy Spirit it says here so in the church of Philadelphia who are those who say Jew, that they're Jews and they are not Jews they must claim to be what? they must claim to be Christians and are not Christians even though they claim to be Christians because they're bowed before the throne are you with me or not? now notice Romans 9 verses 6 through 8 also on the definition of what a Jew is Romans 9 verses 6 through 8 here the Apostle Paul says but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect for they are not all Israel who are of Israel let me ask you are all Israelites Israelites? not according to this nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham are all the seed of Abraham really seed of Abraham? no Jesus said to the seed of Abraham you are of your father the devil that's strong stuff but in Isaac your seed shall be called that is those who are the children of the flesh these are not the children of God but the children of the promise are counted as the seed what does it mean to be a Jew? what does it mean to be an Israelite? it means to be linked with whom? with Jesus Christ so in the church of Philadelphia the synagogue of Satan those who claim to be Jews but are not Jews are individuals who claim to be Christians but are not really Christians they are counterfeit Christians is this point clear? notice also Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 on the definition of what a Jew is according to the New Testament it says there, and if you are Christ's then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise who are the seed of Abraham? who are truly Jews or Israelites? those who are whose? Christ's so in the church of Philadelphia are there individuals who claim to be Christ's but really they lie and are not Christ's yes, absolutely and why are they the synagogue of Satan? why are they Babylon? because they refuse to what? they refuse to enter with Jesus into the most holy place to understand the distinctive truths that God's people need in order to remain firm in these last days now allow me to read you one statement from Ellen White on what the synagogue of Satan is this is Testimonies to Ministers page 16 she says this Satan has a large confederacy, his church. Christ calls them the synagogue of Satan because the members are the children of sin. Why are they the children of sin? See, if you don't go into the most holy place, sin loses its seriousness because the law is in the most holy. The importance of the Sabbath loses its importance. The importance of health, living healthfully and feeding your mind with spiritual things loses its importance the state of the dead loses its importance the idea that we're in the judgment and we need to prepare a character for heaven loses its importance because you're in the wrong apartment Jesus has gone to be some other place and he has distinctive truths for these last days she continues saying the members of Satan's church have been constantly working to cast off the divine law and confuse the distinction between good and evil Satan is working with great power in and through the children of disobedience to exalt treason and apostasy as truth and loyalty did you catch that? 
He's working to what? In the children of disobedience to exalt treason and apostasy as truth and loyalty. Is this uh, claiming to be a Jew and not being one, but lying? Oh yes. She continues saying, and at this time the power of his satanic inspiration is moving the living agencies to carry out the great rebellion against God that commenced in heaven. Now we can understand why the Christian world is in the condition that it is in. In Revelation 14 and verse 8, the equivalent of the synagogue of Satan is spoken of as Babylon. And by the way, do you know what Babylon is? It's composed of three parts. The dragon, which are the civil powers of the world. The beast, which is the Roman Catholic papacy. And the image to the beast, which is apostate Protestantism. Those are the ones who stayed bowed before the throne. And those are the ones that Adventists want to copy now in their methods of growing churches. Hmm. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Do you think it's safe to adopt the methods from systems that have been pronounced Babylon or the synagogue of Satan? Have mercy, folks. We need to reevaluate what we're doing in our worship services. We have to take another look at this. Notice Revelation 14, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Instead of the first angel's message, which leads into the most holy place, what does she give to the nations? She gives to the nations her wine, which is false doctrines, counterfeit doctrines. And Ellen White identifies them as the idea that the law of God is no longer binding, the idea that the Sabbath is really Sunday, the idea that there's an everlasting burning hell, and like and kindred errors, she says, are the wine of Babylon. Just the opposite of the first angel's message. By the way, do you know that Revelation 18 repeats this second angel's message, but it adds some details? Notice Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. This is really chilling and sobering. It says there, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. By the way, this is the message that the final Philadelphian church is going to give. The faithful remnant. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. What is Babylon? Revelation 16 verse 13 says that Babylon is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the civil powers of the world, the Roman Catholic papacy, and the Protestant denominations. Babylon the great is fallen. Is fallen. And now notice this. And has become a dwelling place of demons. Is spiritualism trying to creep into the Adventist church? How can it creep in? By trying to shut the door to the most holy place and open the door to the holy. By rejecting the distinctive message of the Adventist church. Are you with me tonight? Notice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons. A prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Does that sound like a system that you would like to adopt the methods from? Evangelistic methods and worship styles? I don't think so. And yet many Adventist churches are opening the doors to all of these ideas that are coming from Babylon, that are coming from the synagogue of Satan. Ellen White has other early visions where she amplifies what she gave in pages 54 to 56. Allow me to read you one of these, uh, which is found in early writings, uh, and listen to this. It's pages, uh, I believe it's pages 52 to 55, this particular passage here. She says this, This door to the most holy place was not opened until the mediation of Jesus was finished in the holy place of the sanctuary in 1844. Now notice this. Then Jesus rose up and shut the door to the holy place and opened the door into the most holy. Is that biblical? In the light of what we studied? Very, very biblical. And passed within the second veil where he now stands by the ark 
and where the faith of Israel now reaches. You see how she defines true Israel? What is true Israel? Those who go into the most holy place with Jesus. What is counterfeit Israel? Those who are left behind because they don't follow Jesus. She continues saying, I saw that Jesus had shut the door of the holy place and no man can open it and that he had opened the door into the most holy and no man can shut it. And that since, now notice this, and that since Jesus has opened the door into the most holy place which contains the ark, the commandments have been shining out to God's people and they are being tested on the Sabbath question. Do you think it's a coincidence that the pioneers, they go into the most holy place shortly after 1844, and shortly thereafter they're discovering, hey, we better take care of our bodies and our minds. Hey, the dead are really dead. Hey, the Sabbath is the day we're supposed to keep. Hey, the law of God is still binding. Well, folks, look at the, the hour of God's judgment is now in the most holy place. Do they suddenly start teaching a cluster of truth? Yes because they've gone into the most holy and when you go into the most holy you see all of these truths as a cluster of truth as a chain of truth as Ellen White calls it she continues saying now here comes the chilling part you remember those that were still before the throne remember those Satan breathed an evil influence over them listen to what she says here she says the enemies of the present truth have been trying to open the door of the holy place that Jesus has shut and to close the door of the most holy place which he opened in 1844. There's one individual I could give you an example, Dale Ratzlaff. And I'll mention him, you know, here because uh, he's gone on the record publicly in a journal called Proclamation where basically he seeks to destroy all of the distinctive messages of the Adventist Church. In his um, journal or magazine which he sends out I believe it's a monthly publication he attacks the state of the dead he attacks the Sabbath he attacks the law he attacks healthful living he attacks the ministry of Ellen White you would have to ta attack Ellen White because she's too clear on what happened in 1844 so you'd have to attack her also the spirit of prophecy you would have to attack as well why suddenly is Del Ratzlaff teaching all of these things and trying to shake the faith of Adventists and lead them to leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's because he's trying to shut the door to the Most Holy and he's trying to open the door to the Holy. And truly Ellen White said that the greatest enemies of God's people will not be those who are outside but those who were inside and have left. And if you can read in his publications the vitriolic hatred against Adventists, you would understand that Ellen White was right when she wrote this. Because he is a living testimony to what Ellen G. White wrote. So he's a fulfillment of prophecy. She continues saying, now notice what happens as a result of op trying to open the holy place and trying to shut the door to the most holy place. Here is the result. Now she's going to amplify that little statement about Satan breathing an unholy influence and people believing that it was the power of God but it was really the power of the devil. Notice what she says. Satan is now using every device in this sealing time to keep the minds of God's people from the present truth and to cause them to waver. I saw a covering that God was drawing over his people to protect them in the time of trouble. And every soul that was decided on the truth and was pure in heart was to be covered with the covering of the Almighty. Satan knew this, she says. And he was at work in mighty power to keep the minds of as many people as he possibly could wavering and unsettled on the truth. I saw that, the, now notice this, She's going to amplify what it means, the power of Satan being manifested among those who claim to be Christians. She says, I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places was the power of Satan. And that such things would be more and more common, clothed in a religious garb, so as to lull the deceived to greater security and to draw the minds of God's people, if possible, to those things and cause them to doubt the teachings and power of the Holy Ghost. 
Are you understanding? That you are the target of the devil. According to this. I am the target of the devil. He's trying to, to uh, disguise something which is led by him in a religious garb to make it look good when it's evil. Now how does he do this? She says, I saw that Satan was working through agents in a number of ways. He was at work through ministers who have rejected the truth and are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they might be damned. While they were preaching or praying, some would fall prostrate and helpless. Not by the power of the Holy Ghost, but by the power of Satan, breathed upon these agents and threw them to the people. Is she commenting on that little paragraph? Remember the little paragraph at the end of that uh, page 56 of early writing? Now she's greatly amplifying what that means. She says, while preaching, praying, or conversing, some professed Adventists who had rejected present truth that's the most holy place message by the way used mesmerism to gain adherence by the way today it would call, be called neuro-linguistic programming more sophisticated term which was used for quite an extended period even within conferences of the Seventh-day Adventist Church she continues saying while preaching and praying or conversing some professed Adventists who had rejected present truth used mesmerism to gain adherence and the people would rejoice in this influence for they thought it was the Holy Ghost is she commenting on that little paragraph in early writings? oh yes some even, some even that used it were so far in the darkness and deception of the devil that they thought it was the power of God given them to exercise they had made God altogether such as one as themselves and had valued his power as a thing of naught. I saw that the mysterious signs and wonders and false reformations would increase and spread. The reformations that were shown me were not reformations from error to truth. What is a true reformation according to Ellen White? It is a reformation from error to truth. What truth? Present truth. And where is the present truth to be found? In the most holy place. You want to know what present truth is? It's very simple. Find out where Jesus is. If you're preaching the truth of the court, and you're ignoring the, the, the truth of the most holy place, you can be preaching truth, but you're not preaching present truth. Because Jesus is no longer in the court. You can be preaching the message of the holy place, that Jesus is our intercessor, like many Christians preach. It might be true, but it's not present truth. In order to preach present truth, you must preach the truth where Jesus is. And if Jesus is in the most holy, the most holy message is present truth. Now, in another statement in early writings, 261, you need to read all of the early visions of Ellen White. She had, she had uh, profound perception as to what was happening in this church of Philadelphia because she belonged to the church of Philadelphia. The Millerite movement was the Church of Philadelphia. God placed them before them the open door into the most holy place. And Laodicea actually is the Church of the Judgment because it means judging the people. See, the names of the churches themselves indicate that Philadelphia is the church immediately before the judgment begins. Are you following me? Now, notice what she says in early writings, page 261. She says, I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists and the fallen churches. See, this is the good news. Am I saying that all of these churches are apostate, there's nothing good in them? No, I'm saying that as denominations they have fallen. The door has been shut for the papacy and for Protestantism. I hate to have to say that here, but it's the truth. It's been shut. Does that mean that it's been shut for individuals in these systems? No! Most of God's true people are there. And when they go into the most holy place, what are they going to say? Wow! The law of God is still binding. The Sabbath is the day we're supposed to keep. The dead know nothing. I'm supposed to care for my mind and my body. Uh, now it's the time of the judgment. I must prepare a character through the power of the Holy Spirit, fit for heaven. And people love and embrace the truth when they go into the most holy place and they understand what present truth is all about. She continues saying, 
Once again, I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists and the fallen churches, and before the plague shall be poured out, ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. That's the message to Babylon, right? She says, now notice, Satan knows this. And before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. Is she commenting on that last little paragraph of early writings, page 56? They, 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 they say they're Jews, but they're not? Yes, she is. By the way, what does the devil substitute in the churches in place of present truth? She calls it excitement in these religious bodies. That those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Praise the Lord. Now I need to share something with you which is very very exciting. That little passage of two pages in early writings, pages 54 to 56, you say, well, that's more than two pages. That, that's actually uh, one whole page and two half pages, so it's really two pages. Ellen White, those two pages, she amplifies in Great Controversy, page 409 through 562. Do you know that uh, early writings was amplified later in a series called Spirit of Prophecy? Volume 4. And then Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4 became the great controversy that we have now. That early vision in early writings, pages 54 to 56, Ellen White amplifies in Great Controversy, page 409 through page 562. Let me give you the order of the chapters. This is so interesting. By the way, I have here a copy of Great Controversy. And I purposely brought a copy that is beat up. Because I'm trying to send a message. See, for this videotaping, I could have a beautiful brand new copy of Great Controversy. But I brought mine that it has some, uh, some duct tape on it. Because I'm trying to make a statement. What is the statement I'm trying to make? Read it. Wear it out. Because it has present truth. Now, I want to give you the basic structure that we find here. I'm going to give you this, just the names of the chapters. Page 409 to 422, Ellen White has a chapter titled, What is the Sanctuary? Do you know what her purpose there is? Her purpose is to talk about the Old Testament sanctuary and to show that there's a New Testament sanctuary of which that Old Testament sanctuary was a shadow. In other words, she's explaining the, the Hebrew sanctuary. The next chapter, pages 423 to 432, the title of the chapter is, In the Holy of Holies. She's explained the sanctuary, the different services, the daily, the yearly, and now she's going to zero in on the message in the Holy of Holies. Is that uh, what we find in early writings, page 54, that uh, Father got up from the throne, went into the Holy of Holies, and then Jesus got up and went into the Holy of Holies? Absolutely. But there, you see, in early writings, that's just one page. Here, she goes from page 423 to 432. So she's amplifying it greatly. Now listen to this. When you go into the Holy of Holies, what do you see? You see the Ark of the Testament, Testament, and inside the Ark, what? The Law. Listen to this. The next chapter, pages 433 to 450, the title of the chapter is God's Law Immutable. Why would she have a chapter called God's Law Immutable after the chapter on the Holy of Holies? Because when you go into the Holy of Holies, you see that God's law is still in the ark, and it's therefore still what? Still binding. Are you following me or not? Now listen, just in case you're wondering whether she's actually following the same sequence of early writings, allow me just to read you a statement from Great Controversy, page 433. Great Controversy 433. Here Ellen White, in the chapter, God's Law Immutable, 
she begins the chapter by quoting Revelation 11 19 the temple of God was open in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and she's talking about the law being binding because the temple was open the ark is seen in the ark is the ten commandments then you move on and I can't read all of the statements but you move on to page 435 and notice what she continues saying page 435 she says this well let me begin at the top Many and earnest were the efforts made to overthrow their faith. The faith of, the, of the, those who saw the Sabbath truth. None could fail to see that if the earthly sanctuary was a figure of the pattern of the heavenly, the law deposited in the ark on earth was an exact transcript of the law in the ark in heaven. And that an acceptance of the truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary involved an acknowledgement of the claims of God's law and the obligation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Are you understanding what she's saying? Here was the secret of the bitter and determined opposition to the harmonious exposition of the scriptures that revealed the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now notice this. Men sought to close the door which God had opened and to open the door which he had closed but he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth had declared before behold I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it Christ op had opened the door or ministration of the most holy place light was shining from the open door of the sanctuary in heaven and the fourth commandment was shown to be included in the law which is there enshrined what God had established no man could overthrow so she has this chapter God's law immutable the next chapter pages 451 to 460 is titled a work of reform it's a whole chapter on the importance of the Sabbath and how the churches keep Sunday out of tradition but how God wants us to preach the Sabbath more fully so that the Christian world can understand the binding nature of the Sabbath why would she suddenly have a chapter after speaking about the Holy of Holies now she's saying God's law is immutable and she's talking about a work of reform concerning the Sabbath why is she doing this? because when you go into the Holy of Holies you see the law on the Sabbath are you with me? And then she has an interesting chapter. The chapter is titled, Modern Revivals. What do you suppose she's commenting on in that chapter? How about the last little paragraph in early writings, page 56? What do you think? You think? No doubt whatsoever. Allow me to read you an extensive passage from that chapter, and you tell me if this is happening in the Christian world as well as in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She says, by the way I'm going to go through the rest of the chapters in a moment, just put those on hold, but many of the revivals of modern times have presented a marked contrast to those manifestations of divine grace which in earlier days followed the labors of God's servants. It is true that a widespread interest is kindled many profess conversion and there are large accessions to the churches they're called mega churches and giga churches she says nevertheless the results are not such as to warrant the belief that there has been a corresponding increase of real spiritual life the light which flares flames up for a time soon dies out leaving the darkness more dense than before. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth. They say we need to get out of church at noon. We want a sermonette. We want a worship service based on, on music and entertainment. Those are my words. She says, converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth. 
little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles unless a religious service has something of a sensational character it has no attractions for them that's why some people don't come to Fresno Central it's totally unattractive because it's centered on what brings true revival and reformation it's centered on the Holy Word of God not, emo not emotions and feelings she says a myth, now notice this, a message which appeals to the unimpassioned reason awakens no response. People are saying, turn me on! Make me cry! Excite me! Ellen White says a message that appeals to the unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's words word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. With every truly converted soul the relation to God and to eternal things will be the great topic of life. But where in the popular churches of today is the spirit of consecration to God? And White says where is the spirit of consecration to God in these popular churches? The converts do not re renounce their pride and love of the world. They are no more willing to deny self to take up the cross and follow the meek and lowly Jesus than before their conversion. Religion has become the sport of infidels and skeptics because so many who bear its name are ignorant of its principles. The power of godliness has well nigh departed from many of the churches. Picnics, church theatricals, church fairs, fine houses, personal display have banished thoughts of God. Land and goods and worldly occupations engross the mind and things of eternal interest receive hardly a passing notice. Here you have the prosperity gospel that's being preached today in the Christian world. God wants you to be prosperous, He wants you to be rich, He wants you to have lots of things. She so continues saying, now this is the good news, notwithstanding the wide, widespread declension of faith and piety there are true followers of Christ in these churches. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon His children. At that time many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted the love of God and His word. Many both of ministers and people will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed in this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. Now notice this, the enemy of souls desires to hinder this work, this great revival that is coming. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. We are now living in the time of the counterfeit. Which means that the true is right around the corner, folks. She says, in those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. Is this a comment on that last little paragraph? Oh yes. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. And folks these giga churches and these mega churches you read their, their mission statements and you, you find that their emphasis is meeting people's felt needs which are really felt wants not even felt needs. Their idea is Jesus receives you just as you are. In their mission statements you find nothing about the law of God, the need for repentance, for having your life changed. Whenever there's a mention to the, of the Ten Commandments it's very general and nebulous. And I would recommend to you the book by Thomas Mostert, Hidden Heresy is Spiritualism insidiously penetrating the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's not the subtitle, but that's the idea he's giving. And why are these things penetrating the Adventist Church? Because people have tried to shut the door to the Most Holy where the important messages are, and they've tried to open the door to the holy place. 
They've lost the distinctiveness of the Adventist church and our message because they don't want to go into the most holy place that requires an observance of God's law. The Sabbath because we love Jesus. Sending our sins to Jesus with true repentance and sorrow for sin. Knowing that the only the sins that enter through repentance will be brought out by Jesus. And other doctrines. Now, why do we want to adopt the church growth methods of these churches, these popular churches? Why would we go to Willow Creek to learn how to plant mega or giga churches? Churches that openly reject and disdain the present truth message for these last days. Why would we want to adopt their music? Why would we want to adopt their clapping and dancing and entertaining worship styles? Why would we want to adopt their emphasis on cheap grace at the exclusion of God's holy law? Why would we want to refuse to quote Ellen G. White from the pulpit because we might offend the unchurched? Why would we want to dress as them and use jewelry as them? and go and watch what they watch, and listen to what they listen to. Obviously a great blindness has fallen upon God's people. And the reason is, we have not entered the most holy place with Jesus. Are you understanding the importance of what we're studying here today? What we're studying is a matter of life and death, folks. And Ellen White has said that only those who understand and obey the three angels messages will be kept from the many delusions of Satan in these last days and do you know what his many delusions are? the idea that the law is no longer binding the idea that Sunday is the Sabbath the idea that the dead are not dead the idea that you can eat whatever you want those are the final delusions of Satan if you don't go into the most holy place you will be deluded Ellen White says that the three angels messages are an anchor to God's people an immutable anchor, an anchor that cannot be moved if we go into the most holy and we understand these messages and we practice these messages. Allow me in closing to mention an experience that happened at a Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting in the year 1900. Indiana camp meeting. The issue is music. You see the people thought that they could reach the unchurched a little bit better by giving the music that really entertained and turned people on. Allow me to read you what Ellen White said about that experience at Indiana camp meeting. She says this, there were some eyewitnesses there, some pastors that were sent there to see what was going on. And they brought a report back to Ellen White. And she's now going to write about that report. She says, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. What happened there is going to happen right before the close of probation, she says. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. We are seeing that now in many Seventh-day Adventist churches, and I sad to say at many Seventh-day Adventist camp meetings. She continues saying, the senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods. In such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. All of these worship styles are a distraction by Satan so that people can't see the real issues. She continues saying, better never have the worship of God blended with music than to use musical instruments to do the work which last January was represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. Wow. The truth for this time needs nothing of this kind in its work of converting souls. 
A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which if conducted aright might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival and this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. Selected Messages Volume 2 page 36. She continues saying, I will not go into all the painful history, it is too much. But last January the Lord showed me that erroneous theories and methods would be brought into our camp meetings. And that the history of the past would be repeated. I felt greatly distressed, she says. I was instructed to say that at these demonstrations, now notice this, that at these demonstrations demons in the form of men are present. At camp meetings? Wow! Working with all the ingenuity that Satan can employ to make the truth disgusting to sensible people. Have you ever heard people who say, oh I don't like your church because your church, you know, they don't clap and they don't have tongues and they don't have healings and signs and wonders and excitement, you know, people don't clap their hands and have a good time. Your church is boring. Have you ever heard that comment? Yeah, because they don't want the truth that, that, that appeals to the unimpassioned reason. She says, once again, I felt greatly distressed. I was instructed to say that at these demonstrations demons in the form of men are present working with all the ingenuity that Satan can employ to make the truth disgusting to sensible people. That the enemy was trying to arrange matters so that the camp meetings which have been the means of bringing the truth of the third angel's message before multitudes should lose their force and influence. What is the purpose of our camp meetings? To bring the truth of the third angel's message to the multitudes. It is not to entertain people, it is not to give small, soft, smooth seminars to make people feel good. It is to present the truth of the third angel's messages undiluted. Wow. She continues saying, the third angel's message is to be given in straight lines. It is to be kept free from every thread of the cheap, miserable inventions of men's theories prepared by the father of lies and disguised as was the brilliant serpent used by Satan as a medium of deceiving our first parents. Thus Satan tries to put his stamp upon the work of God. What does the devil do? Did we read that in early writings, page 56? That he tried to carry on the work of God at the throne? Absolutely. She continues saying, the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with such a confusion of noise and multitude of sounds as passed before me last January. Satan works amid the din and confusion of such music which properly conducted would be a praise and glory to God. He makes, makes its effect like the poison sting of the serpent. These things which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. God calls upon His people who have the light before them in the word and in the testimonies to read and consider and to take heed. Clear and definite instruction has been given in order that all may understand. But the itching desire to originate something new results in strange doctrines and largely destroys the influence of those who would be a power for good if they held firm the beginning of their confidence in the truth the Lord had given them. Selected Messages, Volume 2, pages 37 and 38. Folks, it is time for a great revival and reformation among God's people. It is time to enter the most holy place of the sanctuary and to discern present truth. If we don't, spiritualism will become the end result. Now allow me to give you very quickly the rest of the chapters that I was mentioning in the Great Controversy. Very, very quickly because our time is almost up. Immediately after the chapter on modern revivals, Ellen White has a chapter which is titled Facing Life's Record. That's on the investigative judgment. That's pages 479 to 491. Then pages 492 to 504, The Origin of Evil. 
505 through 510, enmity between man and Satan. Pages 511 to 517, the agency of evil spirits. Now she's getting into spiritualism, which has to do with the state of the dead. Page 518 to 530, the snares of Satan. Page 531 to 550, the first great deception. And finally, pages 551 to 562, can our dead speak to us? Do you see how she deals with all of the doctrines of the Adventist church when she deals with the issue of the most holy place ministry of Jesus? Folks, I pray to God that we will help our people see the importance of the message that we've studied today because it's a matter of life and death. That we might show people the importance of entering the most holy place of the sanctuary. That their souls might be anchored in the present truth. And they might be kept from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the message which you have imparted to us tonight. Father, it's a strong message. I realize that. And I know that perhaps some people who are going to watch it are, are going to be offended. But Father, help them to understand that the purpose is not to offend anyone, but to present the truth as it is in Jesus. Father, I want everyone to remain firm in the time of trouble that is coming before us. But we have to be anchored in the most holy place. We have to be firm in the Sabbath. We have to know that the law of God is binding when the whole world is trampling on the law. We need to be sure that the dead are dead because... because purported relatives are going to appear to Seventh-day Adventists and try and convince them that the dead are not dead. Oh, Father, we need to be anchored in all of these truths in the most holy place. Help us to be anchored, Father. And help us to share these things with other people as well. We thank you for having been with us. And I thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.